a warning that this episode does contain themes related to suicide and mental illness. Psychosis is... How would I describe psychosis? Psychosis is, some, is when you go into a place of not well, not being well mentally. It's a, it's a place where you start going crazy, actually. Some people hear voices, and there's also the part of um, hallucinations, seeing things that are not there. And there's also the part of just losing yourself, not being in touch with your emotions. It's almost like you're disconnected. Your brain is disconnected to your emotions to your spirituality, like everything just feels disconnected. Five years ago, on the eve of his 30th birthday, my cousin Luyolo asked me to help him write a book. Back when he was 18, he'd spent four months in a maximum security psych ward, witnessing terrifying things in his environment and inside his own mind. Almost 12 years later, he was ready to share his journey of living with a mental illness to motivate and educate others about his condition. My diagnosis is schizophrenia. It wasn't easy, but Liolo had never forgotten a promise he made to himself over and over while locked up in the Vescopi's psychiatric hospital. I told myself 18 years old. I'd never again go back to a place like Vescopi's or a hospital where I'd be locked up behind my will. With his book, he hoped to offer the same motivation to others. People I left at the Vescopi's are still stuck at Vescopi's because they don't have family support. So I'd, this was inspired me to write the book to help more people get support from family and friends so that they can have a chance to get out of these mental institutions and have a better life and understand that their life is not just them staying in those mental institutions. I agreed to read and edit Leolo's work and we began exchanging emails. He wrote about his memories of violence and chaos and also humor and connection with the other patients there. After a couple of months of writing, Luyolo started to reach out to publishers. In one letter to a publisher, he wrote, I would also like to show that it is possible to not relapse, as I have been out of hospital for 11 years and 6 months to date and have not relapsed. With family support and taking good advice and following the right precautions to your mental health, it's possible. I don't remember following up with Luyolo to hear what the publisher said. It was just before some difficult things happened in our family. I was reading Leolo's writing, but I just didn't pick up that he himself had started to really struggle. Not until I got a shocking call. He had jumped off of his apartment building. Welcome to Golden City. I'm your host, Zanel MG, and I love a good story. This podcast is a collection of the greatest stories I've ever heard about the city of gold, Johannesburg, South Africa. In each episode, you'll meet a different Joburger who will tell you their own true stories in their own words. All the ups and downs, adventures, lessons, wins and losses that make life in Joburg truly interesting. This concrete jungle may not have mountains or beaches to compete with the natural beauty of other South African cities, but the diverse and amazing people who call Johannesburg home make this golden city shine bright. What a story. How do you feel about that? Tell me more. I just remember darkness going to Vescopis. You know, just feeling like I'm in a moving vehicle, which is probably an ambulance. Back when he was in grade 11, Liolo had gone to sleep in his boarding school dorm room and woken up in a nightmare. When I woke up, I woke up to a steel gate and then I walked out of that steel gate. I heard a guy screaming, 
So that's prison stuff that prisoners talk. So I was confused now if I'm in prison or what's happening. Only to find out later that I was actually in a mental hospital, mental institution, the highest mental institution wide 71, where they lock you up. Luyolo's mental health struggles started in his teens. In grade 8, panic attack was the first ever sign and something that I remember I don't forget to this day. It feels like your heart is caving in your chest the way you're so worried. So before that, I've never really had any signs that something was wrong with me. Leolo's panic attacks escalated into paranoia, insomnia, and hallucinations, all symptoms of psychosis. He spent a few days in the hospital before doctors sent him back to school without telling him exactly what was wrong with him or how he should treat it. Thus began a cycle of Leolo visiting many different doctors who offered many different diagnoses. I was once told that I have a chemical imbalance of the brain. He saw treatment as far away as Poland. And the doctor in Poland told me that my sinuses, I have a problem with sinuses, there might be a link with my sinuses to the chemical imbalance of the brain that I had because my sinusitis is so bad. So I had an operation on my sinuses. The operation did not help. And when he slipped into another episode of psychosis at the end of his grade 11 year, his doctors referred Liolo to Vescopi's. The Vescopi's psychiatric hospital was built in 1892 in Pretoria, and its opening signified a huge step forward for the care of psychiatric patients in South Africa. Vescopi's was built with the vision of providing a new standard of humane care for the mentally ill. Before Vescopi's was opened, people deemed quote-unquote insane were sent to prison. The directors of Vescopi's followed a decidedly more enlightened approach, believing that patients should be minimally confined and encouraged to enjoy pastimes such as gardening and the arts. Vescopi's sprawling grounds included beautiful gardens, eight grand Edwardian buildings oriented to receive as much natural light as possible, a chapel and a grand hall where musicians and actors put on performances for patients and staff. The original buildings are so beautiful that they've been declared national architectural monuments. But by the time Liola woke up on a concrete slab behind a steel door, the gardens had not been maintained to their original standard for a long time. There were no more plays or musical performances, and the wards were overcrowded. Vescopis was once seen as a more humane alternative to prison, but Liola's experience in the maximum security ward, where patients thought to be the most dangerous were housed, was comparable to prison in many ways. The Vescopis actually, I only found out later that they actually keep prisoners, uh, criminals that are pending cases because of their mental health. So it was actually very scary because it seemed like it also had a lot of gangsters there. It was a very loud place. Because people are banging doors, people are kicking doors. It's that environment of mad people just always, there's always just something happening, or somebody screaming, or something happened here and there. It's very rare for it just to be quiet, quiet. It was a very rowdy place, especially White 71. Yeah, it was, it was I, I can't remember having a sense of peace. The only time there was peace is if everyone was sleeping. And that was very rare to happen. But most people were asleep most of the time, but there were just those patients like me who always just had energy, who actually needed to be sedated in order for them to be fine because energy level is just so high. Maximum ward, the main gate was always locked. If you're not, in your, if, you, if you're in your room, if any time in your room, chances are you're locked up. If you done something really out of the ordinary, then They'd also lock you up in your room with the steel door and the steel gate. Or they just lock the steel gate if you're not that bad. 
just a steel gate. At least you can still see people interact with them. What is worse when that steel door was locked and you can't see anyone. It's almost like a dark hole. This sounds like solitary confinement in prison. Solitary confinement, almost, yeah. I'm comparing it to that. It's the closest thing to that. What were the days like? Did you have a routine? It would be so tiring to wake up from all those meds that you're taking. And, and the meds that you're given, they, it was not a consistent type of meds you're given because the doctors are trying out different meds to see which one you'd respond to. After everyone is done showering, you're all given a toothbrush. Oh, those nasty toothbrushes that the hospital gives you. They just put in detergents. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was actually seen as a cheese boy because my parents, my mom used to give me my own toothbrush to come and brush my teeth with. And some of the guys didn't like that. And after breakfast, I think we used to... Just go, oh yeah, you used to go play games, play soccer. Uh, I was still crazy about my rugby, so I'd always be running up and down, thinking I'm keeping fit for rugby, so that when I go back to school, I can go back to my play rugby. Um, and then some, oh, and then of course, smoking was the best thing you could do there. Cigarettes. And when you ran out of cigarettes, we'd smoke BB, BB tobacco, boxer tobacco. That was the biggest charity there. It's like prison. And then that's after supper was the way most of the most commotion came in most of the time in the night time. We're in your room relaxing and then suddenly you hear a huge bang. Someone was just locked up in the maximum ward for something. And now they're angry at the nurses and the security guards and they bang the steel door because the steel door is locked. And it's just making the situation worse, locking them up, actually. Because, I, I don't know why, but it just makes you go even more aggressive when you're locked up. It's such an unnatural thing for a human being to be put through, I guess, being locked up like an animal. From what you've described, this doesn't sound like a very like healing or therapeutic environment. How did you get better? How did you collect your thoughts and get your sanity back in a place like that? Um, what helped my sanity was behave, behavior. As my, my family visits, whenever my family came to visit me, they always begged me to please behave. And I also had ambitions of being a prefect at school and I go back. So I'd always try to help the nurses as much as possible too with the patients. If um, if a patient is being called out, they're calling out a patient's name for them to take the medication and they can't hear because they're sleeping, I'd also I'd run and look for them and then find them. I knew most of their names and find them, wake them up to take the medication. Leolo's visitors and his goals for when he was back at school, living his life after Vescopies, kept him going. And that's one of the key messages in the book, that he just could not have made it without those things. Very few people in his situation can. I always looked forward to a visitor, I must say. A visitor was so important. In the whole four months I was in Voscopy, it's only one day I didn't have a visitor. Visitors made a huge difference. We had different type of food that the visitors come with. Some would come with money, so at least you have money to buy a boxer or BB or cigarettes. And that kept us going, and. Yeah, sure. Other guys hardly got visitors, I must say. A lot of people depended on me. Some of my family members even didn't like the fact that I always share everything with everyone because it felt like they were almost like bullying or harassing me. But I knew that they had nothing. They had no visitors, so they depended on me to have anything. At Vescopies, Liolo finally got a diagnosis of schizophrenia. They didn't help me understand my condition. I didn't even understand my condition. I was just told I'm schizophrenic. That's all I knew. I didn't understand anything. I just knew I was, I was, just, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And yeah, I just wanted to go home. That's all I wanted. Leolo 
Liolo walked out of the gates of Vescopis in January of his matric year, just in time to realize his dream of rejoining his class. But his doctors ordered him to stay home until his brain had fully recovered. Schizophrenia is a brain condition that affects a person's senses and how they experience reality. According to some studies, the majority of people with schizophrenia remain under the care of family or institutions for their whole lives. Those who do live independently usually do so by taking medication like antipsychotics. Liolo said that for a year, he did nothing but sleep, a side effect of his medication and of the depression that took over when he couldn't return to his school. Then he got up. He finished matric at a school near his home in Pretoria and then was accepted to study at the University of Johannesburg. My mental health was a huge challenge with my studies, actually. It was, studying was the hardest thing to do, especially first year since then, my second year. I was always feeling so drowsy and tired and that it was hard for me to even concentrate in class what the lecturers are saying. And I must thank my friends and that supported me and helped me Gave me my one-on-one support before tests. But I, I marched on and what really motivated me was to be independent because I found that it's very important for me independent and I thought that through education I might find my independence. So it meant a lot to me to have to study. Liolo graduated, got his first job, his first car and moved into an apartment with friends. For any 20-something, these are milestones to celebrate. But for Big Lou, as he's known, we knew that it meant that much more. Um, My family are so proud of me and friends are so proud of me, especially friends that understood my background and how far I've come, couldn't believe. So I had to just make sure that I take my medication and also... Make sure that I don't relapse because my my brain was not functioning optimally after that relapse. That relapse was so hectic up to four months that it took some time to get better and better. And as the years went, I realized that my, my brain is actually functioning better and better each and every year without a relapse. The book wasn't just about surviving or getting out of a place like Vescopies. It was about building a life after and the unique challenges that people with schizophrenia and other chronic mental illnesses face in a world that doesn't really recognize or know how to support them. In one chapter called Diagnosis and Depression that Liolo sent me, he wrote, Life can be a real roller coaster sometimes with so many overwhelming events that I sometimes wonder if I'm not depressed. I probably should check up on this when I see my psychiatrist. Everyone who's got mental health problems goes through what is called, a doctor once told me, it's called dips, where you're fine, but if you don't take your medication, you're going to go through a dip. A dip is when you go through a form of psychosis. It's almost like a heartbeat goes up and down. But if it goes down, it can go really low. You can get can enter a very hectic place of psychosis. You go really crazy. But if you take your medication, there's a threshold where it stops. And you can actually avoid going into um, into psychosis. For all of us, those with chronic mental illnesses and those without, Life's dips come along in the form of outside stresses and unexpected events. A couple of months after Liolo turned 30, our family went through a really tough time. His grandmother, my grandmother, and a grandmother we both share, that's three grandmothers, all passed away within months of each other. Around the same time, Liolo had started taking a new antipsychotic that wasn't quite agreeing with him. And so for the first time ever, he wasn't taking his medication regularly. 
So the paranoia had started, especially with me driving from work and back, feeling like someone is following me. And I also, there was a day where it, what looked like someone who has who had a bomb in their car or whatnot, so it looked like to me. And there were so many things happening the one morning when I went to hang my clothes on the balcony. I saw a man in a van outside and it looked like he was just sitting there looking at me. And it looked like he had a coffee cup, black one that was in the car. And I was so paranoid that I thought that it might have been something else, like a weapon or a gun or something. Liolo reached out to loved ones, saying that he was afraid that someone was trying to kill him. And in response, they did the last thing he wanted them to do, the one thing he begged them not to do. After almost 13 years, Liolo was sent back to a psych ward as an involuntary patient. The worst thing was not being okay and now scared to ask for help from your family because they had already tricked you, tricked me into going to hospital as an involuntary patient. So now that felt very lonely. I just felt so scared and worried, had a lot of anxiety. Also, I was actually drinking a lot more because of this situation my family had put me through. I was drinking a whole lot more and partying a whole lot more. I had a party the night before my accident. During that party, my friends realized that I was not okay. I was not listening to them. I was not responding to, to, to them. They even left me at home to rest whilst they continued partying as we normally go out clubbing afterwards. And I, and I spent the whole night on my own and I couldn't sleep. Whole night I couldn't sleep. I didn't sleep. And when they came back in the morning, I was in the car having had, had no sleep. And if my friends tried to do all they could do when they noticed that I was really not well, especially leaving the house, not listening to everyone. And one of my friends even tried to grab me and hold me so that maybe they could help me. But then I pushed him away. I pushed away hands of comfort and what could have saved me that day. Luyolo lived in a large apartment complex with different blocks. He ran from his own block to another and went up the stairs to the first floor. I walked up to the first floor after I had pushed my friend away from me, she was trying to help. I don't know what led me to even going up the first floor. Because I, well, I stayed in the first floor, but I went to the first floor someone else's place. I felt I was hallucinating a lot too. Then I was hearing voices, people telling me to do the jump when I was up there on the first floor. I think. I might have hallucinated um, changes of weather, maybe. Yes. Yeah, I might have hallucinated. It seems, seemed like there was just a change of weather. And I was also in a different place. Um, I was like out of touch with the world. Out of touch with the world. I was just in my own world, my own zone. And at first I was scared to jump. So I tried to hold on. That's what I remember. I tried to hold on, but then I couldn't hold on anymore. I'm not falling. And I remember falling off. And luckily, my angels held me. Liolo fell over five meters and landed feet first, breaking both ankles and his left shin bone. And the pain on my legs was just so severe. I actually wrote a passage on my book on the landing because I was so going through psychosis so much. It felt, also the landing felt like an equilibrium of sanity was gained through the fall as the pain felt like the pain outweighed the madness that was going through my brain. It, 
it could have it felt like it could have been it could have taken me a longer time to recover from the mental health aspect without the fall or maybe that's why it happened I don't know just remember the ambulance lady called, asking me a few questions I blacked out I woke up again at the hospital when all my family members were around me. Then I had two operations. First operation, they even put the iron steel through my legs. And it was quite painful. And then I had to gather strength to go for a second op after two weeks just lying in bed. And then that was even first time spending time in ICU. Because the pain was so much. The second operation, they removed the steel steel pins off my legs. Just like at Vescopi's, Leolo focused on his goals and on helping the nurses in whatever way he could. I was just, couldn't wait just to be able to walk again as I was on a wheelchair most of the time. And I didn't remember not wanting the nurses to, I fought from pooping on my bed and then giving a nurse my poop. I fought that. I said, no, it can't happen. You can't give someone else your poop to think. So I fought for that. I come, come in my wheelchair, go in the toilet on my own and find a way to sit on the toilet and thing and poop. My own poop, I just couldn't live with that. So I fought for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, for three months, I was in hospital, lying in bed, in the world, using a wheelchair to get around the hospital. And then I started crutches in January. It was December, I was on a walker. And then I left hospital in January, I was at home, and I was... Um, being helped by a physio who was trying to teach me how to walk again whilst using crutches. And one day in February, I surprised her as when I was at home, I was so worried and anxious about not being able to walk and having to learn how to walk again that I taught myself at home one night. And then the following morning when I had an appointment with my physio, I showed a, a surprise of like, look, I can walk. And she was so amazed. And she was, oh, she pushed me quite, she used to push me quite a lot, I must say, so that she told me to get rid of the crutches there and then to try and walk as much as possible. And then and I started walking. Then I also started being able to drive again. Back on his feet and driving again, Leolo set his sights on the next goal. Going back to it was a huge motivation for me. But at the same time, it was also quite embarrassing because a lot of my colleagues must have suspected that I had a mental illness. And then seeing me with crutches, because when I went back to work, I was still on crutches. I was not able to walk on my feet yet. And I had to face what is, not was. Then, then with my, however people perceived me at work. It's not that Leolo was ashamed that he has schizophrenia or that he wanted to keep it a secret. He was just aware that he could face some stigma. And so he just didn't talk about it. It's, I must say, it's also hard for me living with schizophrenia with the medication I have to take. I have to follow the disciplines of this world that we live in having to be at work on time, having to sleep on time, as the medication might make you feel so drowsy. And you f- sometimes you feel bad when you're at work late and you can't even give a reason that it's because of your medications that you're taking that makes you struggle to wake up in the morning. Well, people might think that if you are known to have a mental condition, chances of you of a promotion or something like that are a bit slim. So in the workplace, having to always play this card that you are normal like everyone else and that you can also get what everyone else deserves can be a challenge. 
especially when they find out at work that you have a mental condition. Um, I I was hoping there was a I was hoping there's a cure for schizophrenia, but the doctors told me there is no cure. They just told me that the only thing that can be done is that if you don't relapse for 50 years, then you can be deemed as someone without schizophrenia anymore. If you don't relapse for 50 years, it's possible. There are some people out there actually living with mental illnesses and without relapses longer than that I did. But they just they just don't want to talk about their story, bring it up because of the stigma around mental health. Leolo, on the other hand, wants to tell the entire world his story. The book is still a work in progress, and it now has a title, The Schizophrenic Billionaire. Well, I'm schizophrenic and hoping to give the world billions of people the knowledge of that fact that... Um, of this mental health and support people need and hopefully one day it'll make me brilliant <laughs> who knows <laughs> would my cousin be my cousin if he didn't have his eyes always cast forwards and upwards on his next great goal and his vision for a brighter future we we'll also believe that life has seasons and I'm just hoping that the first 30 was winter and next is spring or something. I'm just positive and hopeful of that. Thank you for visiting Golden City. If you liked this episode, like, follow, subscribe on all social media and streaming platforms. If you love this podcast, give us five stars. I'd love to feature you on Golden City. To submit your story, go to www.goldencitypodcast.co.za. See you next time.